Whoa, cool, check it out. There's like a pond that's formed from rainwater uh, accumulating in this non-permeable basin area here. Uh, this is known as an upper alpine pond. You can see from the clarity of the water, it's both shallow and made of uh, mostly rainwater with whatever uh, fecal coliform bird poop and leaf debris that's fallen in it. This is the kind of um, body of water you could use a life straw to drink out of in an emergency. Uh, it's up where drainage from the hillside has acted like a filter. This is probably around a thousand feet of elevation, something like that. So there's this uh, Dutch super cold extreme athlete named Wim Hof, W-I-M-H-O-F. And he teaches these breathing techniques, um, referred to his YouTube channel, just type Wim Hof breathing techniques. Uh, and what they do is they saturate your body with a higher oxygen concentration and then put you into a hypoxic state at the same interval. And you oscillate between those two states. What you're doing is you're unlocking a mesolimbic pathway in your limbic system uh, that in his case, because he's been practicing for years, allows him to walk practically naked through freezing cold ice water at zero degrees. Um, I don't remember if that's Fahrenheit or centigrade, but it's really cold nonetheless. Uh, probably centigrade since he's in Europe, although um, he's not the only one that teaches breathing techniques. All I'm talking about here is the human cardiovascular system benefits from activity. You know, the words fitness, exercise, activity. It means going and doing something. So uh, Nike's motto of just do it means you actually, using your free will, volition, and agency, have to get up, uh, stop sitting around, binge watching Netflix. Been there, done that. I'm just kidding. Balance is the key. You can do whatever you want. I'm not giving advice. I'm just saying that if you do get out there and go do something, it's good for your body. And the reason it's good for your body is it gets your tissue to oscillate rapidly by increasing perfusion. So as your atrium squeezes harder and faster to force blood out of your heart and into your vascular system, it stretches the epithelial cells in your arteries and veins and capillaries. And what that does is it staves off or it reduces your risk of developing stroke, clot, or embolism. And it also prevents cardiovascular disease. And in the context of getting outside, hiking, running, jogging, swimming, skiing, snowboarding, uh, basically being active, being an active person, not being sedentary. Now, I'm not discounting that rest is important. Sleep is super important. You know, getting seven to nine hours a night of good quality rest means, you know, only having a caffeinated beverage in the morning, maybe not eating close to bedtime. In fact, experts on nutrition recommend you don't eat five hours before you actually go to bed. And that way your digestive system isn't all busy breaking down food into small molecules for your bloodstream to distribute all your cells while you're trying to be in a rest mode where your brain shrinks down and squeezes all of its metabolites out into your cerebral spinal fluid so your liver and kidney can filter everything out. That's why your pee is darker in the morning, incidentally. But this kind of physiology knowledge isn't necessarily widely known. There's a, a small thread or a, a niche of people in every country that are fitness and exercise enthusiasts who certainly have realized these benefits on a, a personal experiential level, but maybe don't have the elucidated literal framework knowledge to communicate that in an articulate way uh, to explain to others why the function of why exercise works. Another thing that moving your muscles during activity or exercise does is it uh, improves the lactic acid clearing mechanism in the um, myofibers. So your muscles are composed of bundles of fibers, protein-based amino acid tissues that respond to electrical impulses by contracting. And the metabolic waste product, lactic acid, is what causes your muscles to burn if you really push yourself and you feel that, that lactic acid burn in your muscle. Well, as you do that repeatedly, not you know fair and balanced, like maybe an hour three times a week, uh, and, and start slow. If you've been inactive for months or years, you know, start going for a 10 or 15 minute walk every other day, increase it to 20 minutes, then 30 minutes, you know, slowly ramp up. Otherwise, what you're going to do is you'll injure your ankle, knee or hip, and then you're not going to want to do it at all. And so if you've been inactive and you've started to become active, pace yourself, 
you're not in a race. The idea is to have a healthy lifestyle. Go at your own pace. You're only competing against yourself. And the goal isn't to live forever or anything. And the, the goal is to get a, a balanced amount of healthy activity. And boy, I'll tell you one trick that I learned. If you're having a little indigestion after eating something, like after breakfast or lunch or dinner, going for a 10 or 15 minute walk, catching the fall when you're, when you're, body pitches forward and your foot catches you that helps to to create downward acceleration that helps m improve intestinal mobility by moving the stuff through your gastric system so it assists your uh, intestines at moving the foods you've eaten uh, through that kind of uh, circuitous snake like route through your stomach I don't remember but I think there's like you know 12 or 15 feet of intestines in your um, soft organ tissue in the center of your abdomen uh, that ultimately exits out of your colon through your anus and poop significantly and interestingly is actually almost 50 percent bacteria in fact applied sciences this youtube channel with this brilliant scientist he was using a bomb calorimeter and this is not an explosive device this is a device to measure the caloric content of food he actually used a homemade freeze dryer and freeze dried some of his poop and then burned it to calculate the residual um, energy, food food energy left in his poop, and he found there was a surprising amount of calories left in his food. Now, he standardized his diet to, to eating something called Soylent for an entire week, which he said is pretty interesting at resetting your smell and taste system since it's kind of bland and repetitive. He uses a nichrome wire and, he, and, and then um, pressurizes the calorimeter with pure oxygen. He uses a very sensitive thermocouple and moreover, an extremely sensitive um, reading meter apparatus connected to that sensor uh, to measure the change in water temperature in a container into which the calorimeter is placed. Well, as it turns out, food manufacturers don't use these calorimeters anymore. Um, most of those experiments done industrially for nutritional labels were completed uh, after World War II. So what manufacturers do is they just, they buy or already own an index table with the calorie content of the ingredient in foods. And so they just add it up like a math problem. That's when you read nutritional labels where they come up with the energy content. Those are estimates. The only way to actually know is to use a calorimeter. Food calorimeters, one, they're kind of rare and really expensive and kind of dangerous because you're pressurizing a metal tube with 100 PSI of oxygen and then using a nichrome wire with several amps of electrical current to heat it to red hot to initiate a combustion reaction. Your gut has thousands or tens of thousands or maybe even hundreds of thousands of microbes, fungi and bacteria that operate just above room temperature at close to your body temperature, right around 98 degrees Fahrenheit, I think is around 30 something centigrade. And what it's doing is it's hot composting your food. And the idea with digestion is that you get a wet hot compost mash which is why it's important to drink water with when you eat you want a kind of a wet, warm wet mat going on in your tummy bacteria will break your foods and we're omnivores so we can eat lots of different things so all those different microbes will break your food down into very small molecules that can pass through the membranes in the gastric system uh, into your bloodstream into your lymphatic tissue and apocrine system and uh, your kidneys and liver and the rest of your flesh and tissue and organs mainly so that you can produce uh, glucose for your brain um, but but also so that you can produce protein uh, to make new cells as your body replaces old dead cells. And um, speaking of dead cells, uh, cancer cells actually become immortal, as in they turn off the apoptosis section of the genes with an epigenetic triggering mechanism using the uh, either a break or dislocation, some kind of error in the DNA. And then they, they ballistically proliferate or start multiplying out of control. Uh, and that's what causes tumors to form. And then metastasizing is when some of those cells break off and move to other parts of the body where they initiate uh, carcinogenic changes in the cell structure of other cell systems uh, and that and then um, it gets really bad uh, because uh, there's an epithelial progenerator mechanism that uh, innervates your arteries and veins and then starts feeding the mutagenic uh, cancer cell clusters with blood and oxygen which helps further the development and that's what as it progresses it goes from stage one to two to three to four those are, those are cancer stages and something like pancreatic cancer for example, um, one of the suspected causes is uh, excess simple carbohydrate and sugar abuse in the diet. So I'm not some whack job uh, saying that eating sugar itself is toxic, but it's a dose-dependent thing. 
like ethanol. You know, if you have one beer, that's that's vastly different than having 12 beers uh, quickly. And the same thing is if you sprinkle a little sugar as a, as a spice effectively, it's fine. But the problem with the standard American diet is that the manufacturers removed all the healthy fats from a lot of foods under the guise of the fat-free movement. And what they, to make those foods palatable again, uh, they switched to adding uh, many different forms of sugar. Um, package names can, there's as many as 60 different names for sugar on packages. Go to a U YouTube and look up Dr. Pradeep Jamnedes, um, The Bittersweet Truth, um, or Dr. Robert L Lustig and the word sugar next to it. Or you could look up uh, Dr. Jason Fung about human metabolism, uh, or Dr. Annette Bosworth and learn about uh, the ketogenic diet and why it works for so many people, at least for a short term, to help reduce the number of carbs in their diet. Actually, speaking of low carbs, before the commercial introduction of insulin via trans genetic bacteria, I think Monsanto at all. Before com before the commercial availability of insulin to diabetic patients, doctors actually prescribed an ultra low carbohydrate diet. So when you eat proteins and fat, uh, your body uh, via uh, gluconeogenesis can convert um, proteins and fats into exactly as much glucose as it needs. And you don't actually have to eat carbohydrates. Uh, people like carbohydrates because they taste delicious. And I certainly think so as well. So I'm not bashing them. They taste, you know, bread with butter on it tastes absolutely fantastic. I'm not discounting this. I'm just saying that in balance and moderation, carbs are fine, especially complicated carbs or complex carbs. It's really the starches, sugars, and simple carbs that are uh, the dose dependent toxic, especially fructose. Now when you eat a, an apple or an orange or strawberries or blueberries, Berries. Yes, they contain fructose, but they also contain enzymes, water, uh, phytochemicals, anthocyanins, and all kinds of other beneficial biomolecules. And that's different than eating high fructose corn syrup. And high fructose corn syrup is not the same as sucrose. Your body can only process fructose in your liver. Every cell group, with few exceptions, every cell in the body can use glucose uh, in the Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle to convert ADP to ATP to make energy uh, in the organelles and components in the cell, uh, mitochondria and such, to make energy for all your cells. So uh, remember that high fructose corn syrup is not the same as regular table sugar to sucrose, which is glucose bonded with something else. I forget I, my biochemistry here. I'd have to hit Wikipedia on that. I kind of got the cliff notes of all of this stuff. If I learned by failing, gave myself either pre-diabetes or type 2 diabetes. I'm not sure. I take a one gram of metformin uh, daily, uh, so that mainly so I can eat some carbohydrates without getting a high blood sugar. Now, through uh, interval fasting, fasting, staying hydrated, going to bed earlier, waking up earlier, and staying fit, uh, I've been able to drop my A1C score from 8.5 to 4. Point. It's one of those. Sure, the, the metformin is probably also helping. If I'm gonna stop right there and wish you a happy merry christmas and a happy new year and thanks for watching this is the start of the trail uh, we see over here the title we're in the cougar mountain wildlife reserve area and i believe this is called the big tree ridge trail big tree ridge trailhead you can see it on the sign it's uh, engraved in this wood sign here too It's a really well-maintained trail. I'm not sure if you can tell from the sound, but it's raining, and the rain has picked up in intensity. I decided to turn around. I left on foot from my apartment, so I have to walk home a couple more miles. I'm going to get soaked, as it were, but that's okay. Just take a shower after this. It's good to work up a sweat periodically. Get out there and get some exercise. It's good for your brain, increases cerebral blood flow. It exercises your lungs and heart. I mean, <laughs> your heart and lungs. If you're breathing intensely and your heart rate's climbing to the point where you can feel your heart pounding in your chest pretty good and you're sweating really good while quickly walking up a steep hill or jogging or running. And uh, if you do that for a half an hour or so, uh, hour, hour and a half, two hours, whatever, um, you can achieve what's called a runner's high. And what that is, is your brain sending out its own supply of neurotransmitter drugs. And the runner's high is endorphins. So those are like natural opioids and anandamide, which is like THC um, and 2-AG, which is like CBD and a whole bunch of other peptides and cytokine signaling molecules. 
And what these do is they create a sense of bliss, peace, relaxation. Exercise improves mood. It improves sleep. Uh, it actually makes your sex life better too by preventing erectile dysfunction. If you're a guy, if you're a girl, it increases blood flow to the vaginal region, which can increase the intensity of orgasms. And those are just a few of the benefits, uh, emotional, psychological, spiritual. Getting out into nature like this too supercharges your lungs with oxygen, since all of these photosynthetic organisms around you here uh, are converting CO2 that you're breathing out and that cars and trucks and other combustion processes emit into oxygen for your brain and all the other tissues in your body. Stuff like that made a mud pretty slippery. It's amazing how a small amount of motor oil, car steering fluid or other oils, on wet pavement or asphalt can produce those chromatic dispersions of light like that. Little rainbows.